Hi, welcome back to Recording Hacks. I'm Peterson Goodwin from DIY Recording Equipment, and I am here again with John Bourne, continuing our discussion of dynamic microphones, how they work, and their place in the modern world. Yes. Um, so we've, in our first section, we covered a very simple version of, of how they work without looking at all at these kind of real world problems that we're bound to run into. Um, so let's, we finished with the output signal from our transformer. Mm -hmm. What do we have there? How does it compare to our input signal? And then let's go from there. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's some inherent things that we're gonna wanna fix in a dynamic microphone. If we mm -hmm. just look at a coil and a magnet and a diaphragm and we put those, that, that stuff together and uh -huh. you know, we get a signal level of some sort and we get, you know, we can fix some stuff maybe with a transformer, improve some things with a transformer. Sure. But um, there's a lot, it's a lot more complex than just that. Okay, uh, I was afraid of that. Yeah, there is, it's deep. Okay. It's deep and ugly, but we're going to go there. All right. So uh, the, the inherent things that are kind of wrong with a dynamic microphone are, you know, it has a resonant frequency, a resonance frequency to that, okay. to that diaphragm. And uh, it has a response that maybe we, a uh, frequency response that isn't quite desirable. Okay. Um, it's not linear by any means and has big peaks and valleys to it. And, okay. Uh, so we're going to want to fix the response a little bit. We're also going to want to um, create a directional microphone somehow. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to do some directionality to it okay. and uh, create it directionally. Okay. It may make a unidirectional microphone instead of an omni one. So we'll okay. talk about that. All right. And last thing is uh, a dynamic microphone is inherently an accelerometer and it needs to be isolated okay. uh, from mechanical, vo mechanical vibrations. Okay. So we're going to need to put some pretty good shock mounting around this product too. Okay. So we'll go into all those three things. So let's start with the response. Okay. Frequency um, response. Right. So there's a resonant frequency to the dynamic microphone coil and diaphragm assembly that mm -hmm. uh, we're going to want to basically damp down mm -hmm. and make it, a little, um, make it flatter than, okay. than it is. Um, the resonant frequency of a diaphragm on a 57 or 50, it's actually pretty low, okay. like in the 100 hertz area. Oh, interesting. And a, okay. That would mean there'd be a big bump in the response that we would want to kind of tame. Right. right. And that's just because of the, the physical character of the mylar and the yep. coil and all that? That's just the, 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 the tuned or resonant mechanical frequency of the mylar. Okay. Um, just being inherently up there. Sure. Right. Okay. So. We, uh, we need to damp that down, and we do that through a couple ways, but okay. the biggest way is doing it through creating a cavity behind the microphone. Okay. Um, so we create air volume behind the microphone. Uh, we also use uh, some resistance materials okay. under the microphone to help damp down that, that, that resonance. Acoustical resistance Acoustical materials. Acoustical resistance materials. Okay, well, yep. so what are we talking, like rubber or uh, or Generally, it's, it could be um, cloth. We use a lot of cloth, uh, okay. resistance cloth that is um, tuned to a specific resistance value. It has a, res okay. a certain impedance to it. All right. um, and uh, acoustic impedance. Acoustic impedance, yep. yeah. And uh, we use cloth. We, we use other various materials. You can just use uh, small gaps of air. Mm -hmm. uh, you can create just a resistance that way okay. um, by restricting the airflow. Okay. Uh, but we also create cavities and, and volumes of air under mm -hmm. the diaphragm okay. to damp down tuned volumes of air, specific values of, of, of air, okay. um, to help damp down those, those, those frequency responses. So looking at our 57, mm -hmm. um, all of this air in here, this is actually contributes to the frequency response of the microphone, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's yeah. all there for a reason. Okay. Um, Everything down into the handle, even, um, wow. and, and through the transformer. Okay. Uh, the volume of air that's between the closing ring and the uh, and the and the transformer there, uh -huh. when you when you screw the handle of a 57 together, mm -hmm. that volume of air is part of the tuning process. Okay. Uh, the volume of air all through here, uh, inside of the shock mount, which we'll get into, is all part of that okay. uh, damping process of getting that proper low end response of the microphone. Okay. So those. These aren't arbitrarily sized cavities here. Yeah, we don't just, you know, create different potting heights or whatever. Right. It's all specifically tuned to certain to certain values. Every every chamber of air in here is tuned to a specific value and a specific volume okay. uh, to get the proper response. Uh, okay. And, so. wh and what about, I guess, what you would call the head basket or the... Yep. Um, we would call that the resonator cap. Okay. And that... Uh, 
helps us get more high-end response, more detail out okay. of the microfilm. And that also uses a volume of air uh, that is created on top of the diaphragm. So putting this cap on, on top of the diaphragm like this, there's a space of air above uh -huh. the diaphragm. Okay. And that space of air is tuned to a particular resonant frequency. Okay. Very high frequency, but it allows us to, as the microphone's natural response starts trailing off, mm -hmm. we create a volume of air above it that's tuned to a specific resonance okay. that boosts a frequency. It kind of picks up where I the gotcha. microphone starts right. trailing off. Interesting. And uh, the more, vo more air you have above there or the bigger holes you have, uh, create a lower fre frequency or okay. the smaller the air volume or the smaller the holes in the resonator cap, create a higher frequency peak. Interesting. So uh, that's used to help extend the response of the microphone too. Okay. So those of us who have ever built a control room or even just tried to treat their mixing room at home know words like standing wave and nodes and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and, and know that the minute you put something in a room, you've got a lot going on that is, you're not in a vacuum anymore. Yeah. So it, it, is it fair to say that we're, we're putting the capsule in a very tiny room with very finely tuned standing waves and, and that kind of thing to actually tailor the response of the capsule? Absolutely. Okay. That's, it's all about chasing resonance frequencies in a dynamic microphone. Uh -huh. and it's all about tuning different air volumes and cavities of air to get the proper response, to okay. get the response we desire. Because naturally, a dynamic microphone and the mylar inside of a gap mm -hmm. and around a magnet doesn't create something that right. is good sounding, <laughs> yeah, right? right? We have to okay. do a lot of manipulation to materials, volumes, processes, uh, everything yeah. to, to tune the microphone to get the response that we desire. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to problem number two. Yeah. Um, how do we get it so that uh, this is not the correct way to talk into the microphone? <laughs> Yeah, so we create... Why, why are those YouTube bunny videos so funny? I know, right? they are, aren't they? <laughs> right. It's just because it's so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, directionality aspect. So if we were to just take that diaphragm and uh -huh. magnet and coil and pop it and pop it on side of the handle and uh -huh. not create any uh, air volume behind the microphone, right. we would have an omnidirectional mic. So uh, all the sound arriving from any direction of the microphone enters the front of the diaphragm and vibrates the diaphragm uh -huh. and conversely the coil inside the magnetic field. Okay. Um, creating a directional microphone, we uh, vent under the diaphragm. We vent around the diaphragm uh -huh. okay. to allow sound to strike under the diaphragm or uh -huh. behind the diaphragm. So, okay, so I've always wondered what this mesh here that's, is. That's all, that's all the rear entry ports okay. of, of a unidirectional microphone. Interesting. And that's okay. an easy way to know if a, if a microphone a dynamic microphone is directional or omnidirectional, is if you see ports around it, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be unidirectional. Right. Um, okay. If you, you don't see any ports, it's going to be omnidirectional. Okay. So uh, conversely, if you close those ports up, you're basically restricting the air from allowing to strike under the diaphragm, mm. causing it to be omnidirectional All right. or creating some very weird polar pattern that okay. you may not want. So the SM57 Omni Mod, you heard it here first. Just and close the ports hacks. up and it'll sound a lot different. That's great. It's only a $5 mod, send yep. money to this our way. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. <laughs> um, so these rear entry ports are, are uh, specifically set to uh, a particular value. Uh -huh. And uh, what we do is it works in conjunction with what we call the D, or the time it takes the sound to go around the microphone. So, D, D for delay? D for delay, yep. Okay. And the, the delay is, is basically the, the space or amount of time it takes from the sound to hit the front of the diaphragm and then diffract around it, enter the rear ports, and then hit the rear underneath the diaphragm. Okay. Um, it's called the D, and All that's right. a specific value. Okay. We uh, then restrict the sound using a, re a resistance cloth, which we talked about. Okay, which we talked about, so, yeah. So uh, what we do is we allow the sound to get delayed using a resistance. Okay. And so when you create a directional microphone, you speak on axis of the microphone. Uh -huh. You get all the sound entering the front. Okay. So let's just say zero degrees. Zero We're degrees, right on yep. Axis. Okay. You get all the sound is entering the front and, sh and vibrating that diaphragm. Okay. Um, as you go around the microphone to 90 degrees mm -hmm. or directly behind the microphone, say on a cardioid microphone, okay. the point of most rejection is in the rear. Okay. Uh, at 180 degrees of the mic. Right. So 
as sound enters, it's actually going to enter through the rear entry ports first mm -hmm. when you're speaking behind the microphone. Okay. Uh, get delayed, and then that delayed value is timed basically to the same amount of time it takes that sound to go around the microphone and hit the front. I've got gotcha. you. Okay, so interesting. when it hits the back, it gets delayed through that resistance. Okay. Goes around the front of the microphone, and essentially they hit the diaphragm at the same time. Okay. Both on the front and the back of the microphone. And thinking about what happens when you've got two identical signals hitting yep. at the same time. That diaphragm doesn't move. Right. And you okay. get rejection. Exactly. Because there's no movement of that diaphragm in the coil. So it would be like as coil. if I had two people pushing with equal force equal force on my hand. Yep. It's not going in it's either It's not going to move anywhere, which means it's not going to move that coil, right. which means there's not going to be any voltage applied to that signal. Okay. Because it's in the magnetic field. Wow. I, that's, it's so... So clever, simple. so yeah, so simple, right? <laughs> but it's so clever at, to, to be able to do that without any power, without yeah. any, um, without even getting to the electronic part first. We've already made it directional. Yes, it was and, really fascinating. And we tune, um, you know, that's all those resistances and values is complex math and tuning. Mm -hmm. um, but by creating different cavity volumes and by creating different resistance values of that cloth or mm -hmm. resistance or the spacing of the holes. Um, that's how we tune the microphones. We tune them either tuning, tuning uh, the polar pattern of the microphone. Tuning the polar pattern, yes. okay. So uh, the, whether it's a cardioid or a supercardioid or a hypercardioid microphone. Okay. Um, or we can just close all the ports up, let all the sound enter the front of the diaphragm, mm -hmm. and it'll be omnidirectional. So how does what we're doing to tune the polar response affect the frequency response? That, that is to say, if, say we took away all of the, the, the porting and all that mm -hmm. and made the 57, same capsule, an omnidirectional microphone. How yeah. is what we're doing affecting that, the tuning of the frequency response as well? Vastly. Okay. They're, they're interrelated. Okay. Um, that's one of the difficult parts of designing and tuning and making a dynamic microphone is uh -huh. every single aspect of this dynamic microphone has an effect on something else. Right. So okay. you can't tune the microphone's response and then go tune the polar pattern and then go tune this. Right. They're all interrelated. You change something here, you're going to probably screw up something over there. Right. And uh, you have to take it, you have to look at it holistically saying, well, we have to take a step back and say, well, if I change this part, what's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? Right. So there's, uh, no, there's no solo button. There's no know? solo button you in, can't, in can't designing a mic. can't mix the snare and solo. No and way. The yeah. They're, every part is doing something else. Interesting. Um, the resistance is doing this and that. Right. The cavity volume is setting this time or this volume of air. So wow. You can't, they're all interrelated. Okay. It's very complex. <laughs> and that's with only two of our, our three problems addressed here. So yes. that's, that brings us to the third real world problem is that these don't typically sit here without any shock and get used. You know, they're all over the place. They're yep. in front of a kick drum. They're on a floor getting mechanically coupled to the floor, that kind of thing. They're in your hand moving around. They're exactly. Going inside and out of a stand. So how do we make it that we hear the sound and not the actual mechanical vibration. What's going on there?